Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, it's good to see uh, a packed room on our uh, occasion of our annual Edith Mary Gaten uh, lecture. Um, my name is Simon Mortimer. <coughs> I'm the head of School of Agriculture Policy and Development. Um, I want to take the opportunity just to introduce you to the school. I've seen many familiar faces who know the school well and have been coming to these events for years, but I know we have a few newcomers in the audience as well. Um, Reading have been teaching uh, agriculture and related disciplines since the late 1890s, so we're now in our 132nd year. The university is about to celebrate its 100th anniversary in 2026, but we, we date a little bit further back than that. And you can see in the top left of my slide one of our original classes down in the centre of town uh, in the 1890s. We're a community uh, of about 730 students. And one of the things that uh, makes uh, working uh, and studying in our school so wonderful is that our students are drawn from 80 nationalities. And you can see the range across the world there in the shaded map in the center. Uh, alongside our um, 700 or so students, we have 147 staff. And they're based in this building, but also on our two farms. And with the associated research facilities we have on our two farms. And our uh, collected output in terms of research is 212 papers in 2023. As a school, we have a budget of about 16 million, and that is uh, drawn from income based on our teaching and our research, about equally, about 50-50. Um, and we farm around 569 hectares. I haven't checked this with James, because it is a figure that is constantly changing. But I think this is our utilizable agricultural area. We have other areas of woodland and, uh, and areas managed for public recreation as well, but I think we're farming around about 570 at the moment. And you can see there our Centre for Dairy Research, one of our flagship research facilities down at Hall Farm in Arborfield. Our dairy herd produces 5.8 million litres annually. Um, and uh, we hold high standing in the world. We're ranked 16th in the world for agriculture and forestry. And that puts us at number one in the UK amongst similar institutions uh, carrying out teaching and research in the subject. And that's a position we've held uh, for a number of years now. So um, that's a very brief introduction to the school. We're very pleased you could join us tonight. We're glad to have you with us. Um, I know we've got a number, I think, from uh, the Aberdeen Angus Society who were meeting uh, in the building uh, today. And uh, this is a, a quick shot of uh, our Aberdeen Angus herd down on the farm. Um, we haven't had them particularly long, I think about 10 years, Chris, is that right? Uh, 2013 they came, but uh, they're performing a valuable role grazing some of our wetter grasslands down on the Loddon. <coughs> I also want to um, take the opportunity uh, at the start of our meeting to mark the passing of Professor Tony Giles, who was Professor of Farm Management in our school for a number of years. Tony uh, came to Reading in 1960, having held uh, academic positions in Bristol and studying at Queen's University in Belfast. Um, and he was the founding director of the uh, school's farm management unit, which is the grouping of academic staff in our school who uh, organise tonight's event and um, coordinate our teaching and research around farm management. So Tony established the farm management unit back in 1979, and he really had that vision to recognise the value of getting colleagues from different disciplines together, whether they were primarily based around husbandry and agricultural science, or whether they were based around uh, business management uh, and agricultural economics. And so Tony had that vision, and um, one of the activities, as I've said, is, is this annual lecture. He was uh, an authoritative voice on farm management nationally and was awarded an OBE uh, in recognition of his work in the area of farm management. And probably um, his, his best known work is, is uh, a book he wrote with Malcolm Stansfield called The Farmer as Manager. And uh, really he was uh, a linchpin and it's good that we take this occasion of our annual Edith Mary Gayton uh, lecture to, to mark his passing. He'll be missed by many. Uh, we owe him a great debt of gratitude. So um, thank you uh, to Yorgos for pulling things together today. I'm going to hand over to him 
to uh, announce how uh, tonight is going to uh, proceed. And I should say a quick thank you to our two Davids uh, for what it looks forward to being uh, a very interesting and stimulating <coughs> evening. I don't think I would need the microphone, I think I can project myself quite loud, but if any of the speakers would like to use it, I'll just give it to you. Okay, so welcome to the uh, 40th anniversary of the Edith Mary Gator Memorial Lecture, so thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, Sano, thank you very much for this brief introduction and also for uh, the kind words for the contribution of Professor Tony Giles to the Farm Management Unit. And before introducing our two speakers for this evening, I would like to um, briefly explain the structure of this uh, session tonight. So uh, our two speakers will give a presentation for around 35 uh, minutes. That will be followed up with a traditional Q&A session and I will invite uh, Professor Richard Trante to chair that session and at the end uh, we have organized some drinks and nibbles uh, where you are all welcome to join. Uh, but let us move into the uh, lecture for, for this evening. So um, as I've mentioned this marks the 40th year of uh, since the uh, establishment of the farm management uh, unit so therefore we thought that we should mark it with um, a unique uh, event, and that's why we, uh, instead of having just one speaker, we thought like uh, inviting two, that would uh, make it special. But beyond that, we also uh, invited two of uh, the uh, two important people that they are not only contributing into the farming community with their own um, way, but also contribute into our uh, teaching. So both they are hosting farm visits with our students. So uh, they are contributing into our learning uh, as well. So uh, let me introduce you to David Christensen, uh, that some of you might also know, who is uh, a dairy and beef farmer and manages Kingston Hill Farm, and David Exwood, who also manages uh, a mixed uh, farm system that includes arable, dairy beef, uh, Sussex, Sussex, suckler herd, and sheep, but also he's the deputy. Uh, of the uh, National Farmers uh, Union. So, uh, the topic for the evening is Smart Farming Management Practices to Revolutionize Agriculture. So, looking forward to what you have to say. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yorgos. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to speak tonight. Uh, our family has a long association with Reading University uh, and, and we value that association. Uh, we've been hosting speakers, uh, sorry, visits from student visits for, well, many years. I can remember them coming when I was this high, so that gives you some idea. Um, and indeed, they were with us last week. So Chris, Chris Reynolds is here somewhere and Chris brought them out last week, which is fab as per usual. I might have come to this university. Uh, I had two choices. It was here or Newcastle. Uh, the problem was that my father knew very well Tony Giles and Malcolm Stansfield. <laughs> so it's clear that if I came here, anything I did that was slightly untoward might have got back to my father, so I went to the northeast instead. <laughs> uh, but that's not to say that uh, I don't hold this university in very high regard, uh, and until recently I've been doing some work here for the NIRD Trust and also in the Agri-Scoping Project as well. So a lot of time for Reading. Um, I think you've got an introduction to our farming on your paperwork, but, but in short, we are large-scale tenant dairy farmers. Um, we've deliberately chosen to milk cows and rear cattle and not diversify. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but we've decided that with, the, with just me involved in the farm, that my uh, stretch is limited, so I would focus on trying to do a reasonable job of milking cows and do it at scale. So we have two units, uh, an autumn calving unit of 600 cows and a spring calving unit of 350 cows. And then we have another thousand odd cattle on top of that, which are replacement heifers and some beef calves. Uh, our spring unit we run as a joint venture with a young couple uh, and our, a lot of our beef cattle are reared in a second joint venture with another farming family. And they then go into the Marks and Spencer's supply chain. Uh, and that is... Part of that is to help us deal with tuberculosis, which is a constant and ongoing challenge in our business, um, and also 
the every calf has a value policy from Arla, um, which means we, we're not allowed to shoot calves anymore, which is a practice we didn't want to do anyway. Uh, I think it's absolutely the right thing, but it does give us some headaches sometimes as well. So that's a little bit about our, our business and our backdrop. Um, off the farm, I have a role within Arla Foods, the European Dairy Cooperative, and I have a role with the NFU Mutual. And as I said, until recently, I had a role at Reading University as well. So it's just an overview to set the scene about our farming. And, and that is that our, one of our targets is to try and keep our operation as simple as possible. Dairy farming is really hard work. Now, that's not a complaint. It's an observation. We choose to do it. But we, can we can't then afford to make it more complicated. So that will, be, that will come back as we go through this, this presentation. And I think the other bit in line with that simplicity is to remember what we do. Um, what we do is we capture sunlight and convert it through plants into products that are useful for society. Be that food, textiles, energy, carbon possibly, and stuff like that. So I think sometimes, again, we can, we can overcomplicate our world and we need to be very wary of that. So when I'm asked a, a question like this about smart farming practices, my, my, sort of, my go-to is, OK, what gives me a headache? What are the problems that I have to face up to and, and deal with on a regular basis? Uh, and I have two key challenges in my business. Uh, one is labour uh, and the other is environment pressure. And I'll, uh, I'll come back to environment a bit later on. But in short, it's both the emissions from my farm, but also the environmental footprint of my farming. And both of those two, I think, with smart techniques, we can, we can improve. Let's tackle the labour one first. Um, we are hugely blessed at Kingston Hill and at Windmill Dairy to have a fantastic team of staff. Really good, loyal, hardworking, determined, intelligent, uh, great, fun to work with people. But as I said before, it's hard physical work. You know, when you've got to go out at half past four in the morning, every morning and milk cows, it's lovely in June, but it's not so special in January. In fact, it's not so special in March right now, given every morning it's pouring down with rain, it seems. Um, so I think we need to do much better as an industry in terms of taking the pressure off them. Now, we've got some degree of automation. There are robots out there. Clearly, there are, there are, there are milking robots. But if I'm honest, I don't think they're good enough. And I don't think they deliver what we really need. We've got to up the productivity of these robots to make them more cost effective. Because at the moment, they're too slow and too expensive. And that doesn't work. They also don't fit in systems like ours, which are grazing systems, and I want a mob of cows to go out and graze 24 hours a day, come back to a parlour and be milked quickly. So in short, what I want is a, is a, is a speedy robotic arm that works on a rotary parlour or actually that you can retrofit to conventional parlours. I think we've got to do a whole lot better. I think an important part of that is I'm not looking to lose people, actually. What I'm looking to do is improve their quality of life. Because they like farming, they want to come and work on us, but the sheer physicality of it wears you out after a while. And, and if we're going to appeal to a wider audience, we may, need to make the job better. We just turn to, to, to the whole environment bit then. Um, I see a key opportunity, a key bit of smart farming here is a much greater integration between arable and livestock farms. Now, I have a problem at Kingston Hill. I've not generally talked about it that much. <laughs> because I've tried to sweep it under the carpet, but I think at some stage it's better to open it up. And my problem is phosphate. I have too much phosphate at Kingston Hill. Okay, and this, and I'm fortunate because I farm in an arable area, so I've got relatively easy opportunities to move it. If you farm in the west of the country and you livestock farm, you are surrounded by other livestock farmers. Those guys have got phosphate challenges too, and nutrient challenges. So I think one of the first things we've got to do is we've got to get much smarter at technology and, and bits of kit that will allow us to get this nutrient into a format that we can move more easily further afield. Uh, we see the River Y catchment at the moment and the challenges that are happening there, but I think that's relatively easy to solve. That's poultry litter. You can stick it in a bulker and move it, a lorry, sorry, and move it. It's much harder with livestock slurries to do that because of the low dry matter. So we've got to get much smarter at the kit. And this kit's got to be simple, robust, reliable, low cost. And I don't think the stuff that's out there at the moment. <coughs> we do some of this already. 
Uh, we've drilled pipes under all our main roads, six inch pipes, uh, and we can now pump our slurry to my arable neighbors and go up and down his tram lines with 24 meter dribble bars, which is fantastic. Uh, I'm blessed that I have arable neighbors that get it and are willing to make a contribution to the value of the nutrient, but not everyone does. Uh, so I think that would be a, a big win for us. Dirty water is also a big problem, particularly now that the Environment Agency have classified it as slurry. Hitherto, you could spread dirty water 365 and it wouldn't be a problem. They've now changed that, and so we have to have sufficient, I'm just checking the time, we, just have, to, we have to have sufficient storage for that as well. This is a resource, and particularly as water gets more expensive, we need to get robust processing and reuse facilities on the farm. In the very worst that we can stick it in the ditch and it can go to the Thames as a clean product, but even better, can we clean it up and use it again? I use 80 tonnes of water a day at Kingston Hill on a regular basis. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of water to, disp to dispose of. Um, cows use a lot of water, so we need to get smarter about that. Just moving on from the whole um, the, the wastage bit, just thinking about the environmental footprint of my operation. Um, because we're being asked about this increasingly. I supply Arla, the cooperative, as I say, and my milk goes to Tesco. Both Arla and Tesco want to know my carbon footprint. Uh, and this is only going to become more prominent. Um, now, that creates a shed load of work for me, a load of data generation and stuff like that. Uh, and I think we've got to get a lot better about that, but I'll come back to that in, in a minute. Um, but in short, what, is, what are the carbon footprints? What they really are is an efficiency indicator. So that's a good, good news story because then that, that's easy to sell to my fellow farmers because if you improve your carbon footprint, you normally improve your profitability at the same time. So that's fabulous. But, but we need to keep it simple. And I think one opportunity, key opportunity for us is, is in grass. Grass is our biggest crop in the UK. And I would say by some margin, it is our least well managed and least well understood. And I think there is huge potential to grow more grass than we are doing at the moment. I think technology can help us with that. Um, we're at the start of the journey, but I look across at the arable sector and I see the sort of kit the arable guys are using, and I don't see the same degree of advancement yet within grass. We did try a satellite system a few years ago for measuring grass growth. We use a plate meter regularly to measure grass growth. Um, a firm approached us and said, we're trialing this new product, would you give it a go? Uh, and the first two weeks it worked fine. On the third week, there were no results came in. And I rang them up and said, why are there no results? And they said, because it was cloudy. And I said, well, clouds are not much good to me. We need to be much smarter about this in terms of technique. Now they're advancing it. They're now combining it with AI. Uh, in my world, that's artificial insemination. In this world, it's artificial insemination. <laughs> so many AIs in our world now. Um, so there's an opportunity there. Um, I think... The other bit then is about data, uh, and I think there are two big opportunities with data as well. First of all, as I said, there is more requirement for information from behind the farm gate for the rest of the supply chain, and that is not going to go away, it's only going to get more. So a big opportunity I think for us is to make this smarter in terms of getting that data off the farm and to those interested parties. But we've got to remember whose data it is in the first place. Um, and also it has a value and there's a real tussle going on at the moment over that value. But I think that's a, a big opportunity to make life easier for us, certainly for me as a farmer, when I'm filling in carbon footprints for Arla, Tesco, I'm locomotion scoring for one and the other. The duplication in our sector is bonkers in terms of paperwork and we can and must do better. I think the other bit about data is the real opportunity. And that's the ability to tease out relationships that we haven't yet seen in terms of efficiency. And I think that's really exciting. Um, there's a big trust bit going here, because when you send data off the farm, we farmers go, well, where's it going? Who's going to use it? Is it going to be used against me? Et cetera, et cetera. So somehow we've got to overcome that. But, uh, but I think this is, actually, I think this is a massive opportunity that's untapped and something we really need to work on. OK, a, a couple of very small asks, small practical asks. Um, diversity is a, a big key now, and so herbal lays, we're all going down the herbal lay route. Um, the SFI scheme is encouraging a lot of us to go down the herbal lay route. The weed control for herbal lays is really difficult, getting them established. 
I need better technology for that. And the other one I need better technology for, and again, a small practical example, but it makes such a difference, is in fly control in cattle. Uh, the fly challenge is getting greater and insects generally. I need better technology that at the same time does not kill the dung beetles out of the other end because we're looking to do the job better all the time. So these are small practical examples of what I need. Right, I'm going to wrap up with a few, just a few observations about what this technology, what these ideas should look like. Make anything new really simple. Um, I don't have time to think and frankly, it's usually worse when I do. Right? <laughs> so make it completely intuitive and don't make me have to work too hard. Make it robust, for goodness sake. Some of this stuff is too high-flying, too complicated, uh, and you need software engineers and all the rest to solve it. Now, clearly, there's going to be a software engineer in there somewhere, but it's got to be working on a Sunday morning in January when the chips are down. Okay. Uh, make it intuitive, as I said. Don't make me think. Uh, almost patronise me with the instructions so I can just get on and do it. If you're going to sell me a new product, prove it with robust data and stats behind it. Now, I see some products sometimes. If I go to the, the, the um, Dairy Tech last month, row after row of people trying to sell me products. As a colleague said to me, if I use every product here, David, this time next year I'll be a multimillionaire. All right? Most of this stuff, as far as I can see, is very precarious. Let's get some sound science behind it and let's understand the stats. 34 years ago, when I was in a lecture room like this, I hated statistics. It was my worst lecture of my three years at, at Newcastle, but it is of such, such fundamental importance. Make these, mod these new products, these new developments cost effective uh, and make them easy to purchase. And I much prefer a link <coughs> to a purchase. <coughs> and the reason for that is because I don't have to put the capex up front but equally as important, it keeps the other party interested and engaged. And I need that ongoing engagement and support. <coughs> I need that reassurance. And finally, make sure it works. And I'll give you a very practical example. Um, once a month in Arla, we announce the price, that the milk price for the next month, and we have a telephone meeting to do this, which I chair our region. Um, we record the discussion on that so we can circulate it around the wider business. Uh, the agricultural manager does that. We have a new agricultural manager, a new bright young gun, and he said to me, David, do you mind if I use an AI tool to record this information, this meeting? I said, no, by all means, go ahead. You just get permission of the others. So we duly do this. Uh, I then get it after the meeting. 38 pages come out of it then because it's captured every um, ah, stop, <laughs> everything like that. What's slightly more concerning is somehow it managed to pick up that I had used the term French kissing one three times. <laughs> this is a call about milk price, all right? Uh, it is dull, and I might try and liven it up, but probably not with the term French kissing. Right? I've been married 33 years. It's not a term we use at home anymore. <laughs> so I don't know where that came from. But the key point is we've got to make sure this kit works and is reliable and sensible for us. Um, I hope that's been of some interest. I hope that's just stimulated some discussion uh, for later on. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for your time. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for asking me along to talk tonight. Um, I will start by saying that uh, I am, of course, now the Deputy President of the NFU. I was elected two or three weeks ago and it has been something of a whirlwind. Uh, the jobs have gone up, the problems have gone up. Um, I'm now taking on Red Tractor Farm Assurance for my, for my sin. That has been landed on, and so it uh, has uh, preoccupied my mind somewhat. But look, um, it's a great job. I'm very lucky to do it. And uh, you don't do it for the easy jobs, you do it for the hard jobs. Uh, you feel the presence of those who've gone there before you, always in my job, and it's a pretty select bunch, but there are uh, some ex-office holders and present, uh, presidents always around, and I know there's one watching me this evening, that's always the way, isn't it? But uh, it will be reported back what I have said. Look, a little bit of an introduction about what I am. So, uh, apart from my job with NFU, I'm a first generation tenant farmer from Sussex. We farm about 1,200 hectares on a, effectively a retirement FBT with, uh, for a large public school. Uh, Christ Hospital, you've probably never heard of it, but they are the wealthiest public school in Britain. Um, they happen to own some, own some land. They've got uh, assets of about half a billion, which is anything you can imagine. Uh, um, shopping centres, office blocks, you name it. 
they happen to own a, few, I own a bit of land in Sussex, which I farm, but I do have uh, a thousand boarding children in the middle of my home farm, so the academic bit is quite familiar to me, I have to say. I started at the age of 20 with 160 acres on a farm that was so bad, nobody else wanted it. Um, it was rent free for the first year, it was that bad. Uh, I think the second year I paid 300 pounds and that included a cottage as well for me to live in. Uh, that's how bad it was. But of course, like all things in life, you wanna take on something that's really bad, not something that's really good, because it's really easy to make it better. And it was, it turned out to be quite a good farm uh, uh, that needed a bit of love. And my, look, it's grown and grown and grown. Uh, uh, I now farm with my two sons. One works at home doing what I used to do, the other one works in the city, but they're both very much part of the business. Uh, and we have come a long, long way. Um, and, I, and we're driving on at home, we carry on. So let's get on to, uh, let's get on to the lecture. So how do you know when you're living through a time of change? What does it feel like? Do we know it's happening? Can we sense it? Is it around? Or do we just look back and go, oh, the change was then, we've been through it. It was just, it's behind us, it's not in front of us anymore. I mean, when, you know, let's look back in history, when the Berlin Wall came down, I think we all knew, for those of that were around there, you knew that was going to be a change. You knew that was significant. And indeed it was. The world did change after that. Now, I think change perhaps feels less obvious. Yes, we've had COVID, <coughs> Ukraine war, some big economic shocks, but uh, there is significant change happening. Make no mistake. I, I, this is a period of change. And we are going to feel it all, particularly, I think, in the next decade. Change often happens around elections and referendums. We know that more than anybody in this country. But 2024 is the year of elections globally. Uh, we have elections in, US, in the US, Europe, Russia, India, Indonesia and the UK. Over 2 billion people will go and vote this year. Over a quarter of the world's population. That's 80 countries. It is an extraordinary year. Uh, but why does that matter? What is going to happen as a consequence of all that? Look, how will doc democracy comes out of it? Um, will there be some re entrenched views reinforced? Hard to say. But what is the consequence of that? Why does that matter to us here? I think what we've got going on at the moment is we've got quite a split in approaches to, to the world. We have one half of the world, perhaps our half of the world, if you want to call it that, the democratic Western nations based around the G7. They accept climate change, they're moving away from fossil fuels, they're going to face in to the challenge of carbon and what it means uh, for the economy. The other half of the world, perhaps that includes Russia, India, China, Africa, South America, they're going to carry on using fossil fuels. They're cheap, they're available, they're going to base their economies on them, they've got no intention of moving away from them. Why would they? They can't afford to reinvest. Uh, they have no plans whatsoever. How do global trade survive in that world with those two very different approaches? Approaches. How do you trade food globally in that situation? Can you have carbon border adjustments that will take into account of that? Uh, how do we as farmers, you know, in a global trading world, allow for those two very, very different approaches? Um, I think it's going to be a challenge, but you know, it is a challenge we'll have to face into. My point is that smart farming will always survive. The more efficient you are, just as David said, the more efficient you are, the lower cost you, you have, the more productive you are, you have a lower cost product and you will have a better carbon footprint. So the answer is we have to push on productivity. Good business pays, it has always paid, it will always pay, that is what the future looks like. And that is the way we cope with those two very different approaches to the economy. We have an election coming this year, of course, uh, in the UK. I'm not going to predict the election, there's no point in that. Um, but we do know we probably, it's, it's likely we're going to have a change of government. I think we can expect that. Whatever, whether we do or we don't, what we will have, probably, is a government that's going to be there for five years. And all the political uncertainty that we've had in the last parliamentary term will be gone. It's going to be a very, very different approach. The GOPS government will be there for five years, maybe ten. That's going to feel very different for us. Do they need us? Do they need our vote? Do they care what farming thinks? Uh, I think that's going to be really, really challenging. What I'm clear is, yes, in with my political hat on in the NFU, we have to fight the election this year, but actually we really need to think about the next election. 
the one that's five years away? How do we main, remain relevant to that government that wants to win that election? How do we make the case for farming for five years down the line? It's going to be tough. I think what I will say is about whoever the next government is, money is going to be tight. There's going to be no free money out there. We're going to have to fight for that debt for budget. We're going to have to demonstrate value, what we deliver to the economy, what we deliver to the country. Nobody owes us a living. Yes, we can deliver on food in the environment. Yes, we all know we want that. Yes, food security does matter. I'm sure the next government will agree with that. And yes, of course, we can't rely on other countries to feed us. But we must not. We cannot take anything for granted. So how do we be relevant to the next government? I think there are two things that will win out. <clears throat> Being active on carbon, just as David said, that is going to be the agenda. It doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not, that is going to be the agenda. And growth. Why growth? Because the country is broke and they will need taxes to spend on their projects. And if we don't have growth, they don't have enough tax. Or they don't, they don't have enough tax and they don't have enough money to spend. So growth is going to be key. So we will have to engage with those agendas. We will have to deliver on that. We will have to be relevant to them. We will have to demonstrate how we can, we can move forward on those two areas. Can we do it? Yeah, we can. Can we win that argument? Yes, we can. But don't expect it to be easy. They won't need our vote in the way they have done in recent times. Let's move on to smart farming and what I think uh, smart farming actually is. Uh, for me, it's actually less farming. Um, we've been in a period, perhaps I could describe it, of uh, macho farming, where bigger is better, more is better. It's all about, you know, that kind of, that, that, that big thing. I'll give you for an example that. Um, John Deere recently launched their new biggest tractor. I mean, 850 horsepower or something. You know, fantastic. Now, there was a time when I would have looked at it and thought, oh, that's great. I might, I'm, probably doesn't, I don't need it in the world of Sussex, but you'd have thought that was a good thing. Actually, I think we are moving away from that. I think we're moving to a period where the challenge is less, less farming, less, you know, big things, is, is more is less. That doesn't mean less yield. I absolutely, anybody who's been to my farm, I know some of the students will have been to my farm, I am all about yield, but it is yield with less. So what does that mean? Easy to say, what does that actually mean? I think we need less nitrogen. It's volatile, price-wise, you know, but it can be very expensive. We tend to lose a lot of it when we put it on the field. We easily lose 20% of it sometimes when it's supplied. Um, it accounts for 2% of global CO2 emissions, so you can be sure they're going to be going after it if they're going to be tackling carbon. We need to use less nitrogen. Well, how do we do that? When we do spread it, we've got to make more use of it. Now, that probably means adding inhibitors to it, so it, it has slow release, it volatilizes less, more of it gets into the crop that we want. We also have to look at new sources of fertiliser that don't have the same carbon footprint. Green ammonia is an opportunity. Now, whether that is how that's made is a really good question. And I think this is one of the technological bits that is coming that we can't quite see yet. Yes, you can use all the offshore wind that we have in this country. You can use that to split, uh, um, split water into hydrogen and oxygen, you store the hydrogen, then use the hydrogen to do the, make the artificial fertilizer to power the Harbour Bosch process. We do actually waste a shocking amount of our offshore wind at the moment because we can't connect the, the North Sea generation that comes into Scotland to the population in the South. You don't want to know how much electricity we generate and then throw away. So actually, by using it to generate hydrogen, we can store the hydrogen and you know as it fluctuates and then use it to make uh, green ammonia. Yeah, there probably is a future on that. Will that happen? We're behind the curve already. The Norwegians, the Spanish are already on this. In the Spain, they're using solar power, electricity to power the, 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 the hydrogen separators. They're using hydrostatic, um, hydrostatic, hydroelectric power in Norway to do it. I think uh, hydro, uh, um, um, Yara have a plan to produce a million tonnes of that fertiliser this year. They are moving quickly on this. It will come. There are contracts out there, there to, to produce this for M&S particularly are leading the way. Look, is that going to be the future? Hard to say. It does cost more. We'll have to be more careful we use it. Is there enough return from the market to use it? I'm not sure, but I think it is inevitable it will come and we must see it as an opportunity. 
I think we should use less inputs. Uh, David talked about herbal yay, lays. Yes, we should use herbal lays. You need less fertilizer, you, you, know, you, you maintain production. Why would you not do it? There's clearly benefits in that. Less sprays. I, I use, I grow a lot of oil seed rape on my farm. I use a lot of propismate, cur. Um, it's not that I, we need less active ingredients. We need the tools in the toolbox. But look, if I have better control of my black grass and I use less propismate, it's less likely to get in the water. It's going to cost less. There's less environmental damage, but I've still got it there as a tool if I really do need it to control the grass. So look, less sprays is a good thing. Less insecticides has to be a good thing. Why would you not want to do that? If we can use less insecticides, you're clearly going to benefit biodiversity on your farm. You're clearly going to help the beneficial insects. It's a good ambition to have. We should do it. Just as David says, less worms as well. We're cutting out worms on our farm. We want to protect the dung, be dung beetles. On our, we, want to, we do all we can for the bio biodiversity on our farm. We're not costing yield or output. We're not trying to achieve less, but actually just using less inputs to do it. I think we should use less tech. I know that uh, sounds a little uh, uh, ironic, but actually really focus on the basics. It always amazes me that people will gladly spend hundreds of pounds a hectare on inputs and forget the basics. It's really, I just think it's one of farming's greatest failings sometimes. What's the point of doing all that if you haven't got the drainage right, your soil structure right, your organic matter right? Get those right before you spend money elsewhere. Spend money on infrastructure as well. Tracks, farm tracks, the most basic thing on our farms, so often are neglected. If you're going to get a 10 tonne a hectare crop a week and then you can't get it out of the field quickly, what is the point? Spend money on the basics. Um, perhaps if I sum it up, have a little bit le less lipstick in your farming and a little bit more soul. Do the basics well. Of course, like all politicians, I'm going to contradict myself. There are some things we need more of. We need more measurement uh, and less guesswork. Just measure, measure everything. Just doesn't matter what it is, measure it. Because the more you measure it, the more you will understand, the more you'll have the data. Yes, you can fight over the data with your, your, uh, uh, your market and your customer, but you've got to have the data in the first place. My son at, to at home, Tom, he loves measuring everything. We measure fuel, speed, um, uh, daily live weight gain, you know, the amounts of everything, yields, everything, you know, rain, you, we measure it all. And I'll give you an example of this and why this matters. I, as my farm has grown, I noticed where I farm that my friends farming just five miles south of me, their wheat harvest was about a week ahead of mine. Not far away, but a whole week, always consistently coming earlier. Well, why was that? Well, I worked out it probably was because it was slightly lower in altitude and nearer the sea. And that was gaining. Now, as I have, my farm has grown and my farm has kind of moved south nearer the sea, and we do measure the light daily light intensity. We have the weather stations on the different farms and I can see it. And I can tell you that my most southerly farm that's nearest to sea has on average 10% higher uh, UV intensity on a sunny day. So I can put the numbers and the evidence behind what I knew my gut feeling as a farmer. Now gut feeling as a farmer is great, but actually having the evidence and data to back up what you're doing is really, really important. I would also say that Look, uh, in terms of satellite, radar satellites watching what we do uh, are incredibly powerful. They're out there. There are people that know a lot more about your farm and your yield than you do. Uh, you can buy that data quite cheaply. It's quite available. Um, the RPA have it too as well, I will tell you. When everybody says, oh, SFI is a bit easy, but they're never going to catch me out. Don't be so sure. They are looking. And of course, the one person who knows where your farm is, because you gave them all the maps, didn't you? And they know what that yield data can match that up with the yield, the radar satellite yield data is the RPA. Nobody else can do that because nobody else knows exactly where you farm. Just remember that. More management. Um, I think David alluded to mixed farming, perhaps, uh, and that balance between uh, livestock and arable is the future. Mixed farming, I do it on my farm, it definitely it will solve so many of the problems. But of course, the problem with it, and the reason many people went away from it, is because it needs more management. It is more technically difficult. It is harder to do. But we've got to accept that. We're going to need a higher level of management to have those mixed systems to make the best of the, the, the blend that they offer. It's not as easy as a, simple, as, a, as a monoculture, but we're going to have to do it. 
I think finally I want to say the one thing we really do need more of is learning. We need a whole new generation of learning to cope with the change that is coming. Doesn't matter how you do it and everybody will learn in different ways. Now for some people the best thing is farmer to farmer. It's getting out there, seeing what they do, that kind of peer learning. It might be a farm walk. It might be all the universities and monitor farmers, demonstration farms in the country coming together to build a network of everybody showing all the good things that can be done. It doesn't really matter. It might be a discussion group. It doesn't matter. But that farmer to farmer learning, we probably how we learn best, how we understand what it looks and feels like, because you can talk about it, you can discuss it, you can read about it. It's not actually sometimes till you go and see a herbal lay in action, you really understand how it will be. Of course, uh, everybody learns in different ways. Now, my son would say, well, that is just, that's just, you're showing your age there, Dad. You know, he, he, you know, I learn off YouTube, and he does. Both my sons teach themselves off YouTube. There is a video out there for everything you want to know. And it's very powerful, and it's available, and it's free. And that's really great, and I love it, and I love that they can do it. I have an old 8640 John Deere tractor, I love it, and it's something one of my sons and I sort of work on together. He taught himself how to rebuild the spool valve on that from a YouTube video. It's a 50-year-old tractor, but he knew exactly how to do it because there's somebody out there in the world who's done it. So look, it doesn't matter how you do it, LinkedIn, TikTok, whatever it is, Find the source of learning that's there for you because you're going to need it. I've talked a lot about change and I, I suppose I do still want to address this. Do we have to change? Do farmers have to change? Now, I don't think we can put too much on farmers because most farms are ultimately small businesses, even the large ones. They're small businesses trying to do the right thing. Can they cope with global change, global economic system change on a family business somewhere in the UK. It's tough and it's difficult and we cannot expect them able to be able to do this and definitely not doing it on their own. People are gonna need help, they're gonna need understanding, they're gonna need partnership, they're gonna need trust, investment. So I think we have to be able to reach out, work together. There needs to be partnerships between uh, the retailers, uh, the processors, the banks, Everybody is going to have to work together to help people learn. So change, it is inevitable. I don't know what it looks like. Just as David said, are we going to be using robots or not? And which fuel is going to be powering my tractors? Which fertilizer am I going to be using? I don't know. I think one of the most exciting things I've seen was at Cambridge University, the people founded by the Gates Foundation, I have to say, who are trying to adapt wheat so that it fixes nitrogen uh, from the air. I mean, extraordinary work, extraordinary challenge. It's gonna take, it's gonna take decades to do it. They're not there, it won't be there easy, but they're working on it and they will achieve it. When that lands on our farms, I don't know, but goodness me, that's gonna make a difference. It will come. So we don't know what change looks like. We don't know what speed it's gonna happen, but it is gonna happen. So look, I've talked a lot this evening about what I think we should do less of. The one thing and the one message I want to take is that above all else, we've got to do more of, it's learning. We're going to need it, so please start now. Thank you very much.